Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today uh, for today's webinar. Uh, we're going to be, it's titled Embracing Telehealth for Improved Access and Quality Care. Um, my name is Matt Brown. I am the Vice President of Telehealth at CHG Healthcare. And just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Um, number one, if you have trouble with your audio or video, simply log out and then log back in. Um, this webinar is also being recorded and will be shared with you via email in just a few days. So you can share it with, uh, with your teams. Uh, also, if you have questions for our panelists, please add them in the Q&A section, uh, not in the chat. So if you go down to the bottom of uh, your, the webinar, you can hit Q&A and that will show for our panelists. Um, I've actually been really looking forward to this discussion. Um, I'm pleased to introduce our two panelists for today. Um, joining me today are Blocks, Brock Slaybach. Uh, he's the Chief Operating Officer at the National Rural Health Association. Brock, we'll have you uh, go on mute and chime in. Uh, good afternoon, Matt. Great to be with you. All right. Hey, Brock, welcome. Good to Thank see you. you. All right. And also Dr. Kaiser Kaderi. He's the, the Director and Founder of the Stanford Human Perception Lab. Uh, and the Stanford Vision Performance Center. He's also um, an ophthalmologist and a surgeon. So uh, Dr. Kadari Kaiser, if you're in the chat there. Hello. Hello. Good All to right. be here. <laughs> Great to see you. Great to see both of you guys. Thank you and welcome. Um, both of you have a lot of industry knowledge around telehealth and actually some really unique, unique ways that it's been uh, used during the pandemic. Um, prior to the pandemic and how we, uh, your perceptions of how it's going to be used going forward uh, to really continue to benefit patients. Um, before we jump in with the panelists, before we get to Brock and Kaiser, um, there are a few things that I actually want to do a quick poll to get us started. So this is for the audience. Um, let us know what ways you are currently using telehealth, and this will kind of help us guide the conversation. You should see that pop up on your screen right now. Um, the options are patient screenings, acute care insight in the hospital, outpatient services only, primary care, psych visits, or we're currently not using telehealth. Okay. Just a couple seconds here. All right. Now we should see those results. I think those should be made available. Okay. 16% in patient screens, acute care inside the hospital, outpatient services only, primary care and psych visits. But actually, uh, I love that uh, actually everyone is using telehealth. There are zero folks who said they're currently not using it. Um, perfect. Uh, any, uh, Dr. Kadari, let's start with you. So you're an ophthalmologist um, and a surgeon working at Stanford. Um, you know, you're right in the, in the Bay Area, in the Valley, where you guys see a lot of innovation and, and some interesting things that are happening around telemedicine. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, how Stanford and your de department specifically have been taking advantage of telehealth during the pandemic, how, you, how you've seen this play out. Yeah, so, um, so thanks for the question. You know, ophthalmology has been one of the services that has been using telemedicine for, you know, probably over a decade in terms of uh, screening for diabetes. Um, and so that was something that wasn't unfamiliar to us. But I think just like everybody else, uh, you know, with the pandemic, things kind of uh, really shifted where we weren't just doing asynchronous, like reading outs of, uh, you know, um, pictures of the retina. We're now actually engaging in patient care and, and doing actual visits because, you know, our, our system was shut down. And in that sense, um, you know, at one point there was a complete lockdown and we could only do a lot unless it was emergent cases, virtual visits. And the Department of Ophthalmology is the highest volume uh, department on the Stanford Healthcare campus. So, um, it took a lot of learning, but at the end of the day, um, I think it's now become a little bit more of a mainstay. And I know that we'll be talking about some of the, the practices and so forth that we did, but you know, one of the things I think that's really provide is a different type of uh, accessibility to patients. Uh, and also um, you know, a, a different type of lens of quality of care, because now you're actually having direct one-on-one -on -one where you know, in, in clinic, you'd come see us, you know, most of the time we would be you know, doing charting as we're as we're doing parts of the examination uh, in terms of history taking. So we didn't have that, that, that 
quality of you know face to face uh, interaction, which I think uh, telemedicine provided. But yeah, the overall the campus in general, we've all been um, uh, very equipped to adopt it, and we'll talk about some of the things I think and uh, uh, some of the the different ways we've been using it. Yeah, one one thought is, is as you were explaining, that's pretty ironic that. Uh, one of the barriers for telehealth to really take off prior to the pandemic was the impersonalization of the communication that was taking place between the physician and the consumer. And in fact, it actually created quite the opposite dynamic for you guys, right? Exactly. Yeah, it became more personal and you could ask questions that you typically wouldn't, wouldn't do because you're too busy just trying to see the patient go on to the next patient. So I think in a lot of ways, it's kind of shifted back to how it used to be in some ways with like the old doctor visits and house calls where you got to spend more time with, uh, with the patient and they could accept the accessibility part was, was something that was unique as well. Uh, because you can, you could also shift the hours that physicians were available as well. I love it. Thank you for that. And then Brock, I'm going to flip over to you. So welcome. It's good to see you Thank again. You. Um, you know, so in staying in the same vein, um, I think a lot of people um, kind of think telehealth has been a boon for rural health systems, just like, you know, Kaiser offered up um, having that personalization and maybe some of that contact um, that maybe that had been lost in medicine before that we're kind of getting back through these virtual visits. Um, you know, why is telehealth maybe a little bit harder for some of these rural systems to implement? I know that in somewhere like Stanford University that maybe has a lot of technology and physicians that are used to the technology, may look a little different than some of the rural facilities that you're supporting or that your organization is supporting. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what, what maybe uh, looks a little different for the rural health folks? Well, thanks, Matt. And um, I, we're going to transport the listeners from Palo Alto out to rural America and um, understand the context is very different, although there are many similarities. And I think that when we look at um, how this technology is being deployed. Uh, we saw in the beginning, just like um, Kaiser said, there's a tremendous, there was just an immediate and abrupt shutdown in March of 2020. And our clinics were emptying out. Uh, the hallways of hospitals were bare and there was this need. So then what was created was the business imperative. Um, there were patients sitting at home, fearful of going out and catching the virus when they come into a waiting room. Uh, there were providers who were nervous and, and, and anxious about seeing patients in their clinics because of this, this condition. And so there was a need to stand up something fairly quickly. And so many of our providers uh, depended upon some old technologies like the telephone. Um, so we had the uh, 1135 waivers that were issued by CMS that um, enabled our providers in rural areas to implement this technology, whereas before they could not due to regulatory restrictions. And I would say that was the primary um, inhibition in the beginning or before the pandemic. The pandemic opened up all of those vistas. So just one example. Uh, now, an originating site in the definition of Medicare um, and other state laws and regulations uh, can include a patient sitting at home. Uh, this, is, this was an expansion of the 1135 waivers. Uh, this also included the ability for rural health clinics and rural hospitals to become uh, what we call uh, distant sites. Uh, whereas before they were not able uh, to serve in that capacity. Um, I will remind everyone on the line that we are still operating in many cases, uh, many of these um, program changes within the 1135 waivers, we're still operating under those public health emergency waivers. And so once the public health emergency ends, uh, many of these flexibilities and uh, and and, and helps to rural providers and to urban providers uh, will go away. And so we are definitely at the National Rural Health Association uh, working uh, with Congress to try to perpetuate uh, these uh, programmatic changes uh, post uh, pandemic. But to answer your question directly, some of the inhibitions are 
in addition to the regulatory issues standing up this technology was just how do we fit this into the workflow of a clinic? Um, this became more problematic after the uh, elective and non-emergent procedures were able to resume in about April, May-ish of 2020. Um, and we could see now that we could see patients in person and also see them uh, using telehealth, telemedicine. And so then the workflow issues became paramount. How do we get the so software? How does this integrate into the electronic health record or to our paper record? How can we make sure that the care is not uh, being left out so that if you're looking at an online version, it's not something that was written on a piece of paper through a consultation on the phone uh, that's kept someplace else. So how do we integrate all that? So some of that became really critical. The other thing, and this is something that we can't underestimate, is the education of the patient and the ability for the patient to navigate some of this technology. And now I'm speaking for particularly the Medicare population, mm -hmm. uh, people who may not have been that comfortable or maybe just go online to look at Facebook or, or whatever. Now they're having to navigate this, uh, this new technology in addition to trying to connecting to a provider and then answering questions. Um, and this created, I think, some, some uh, slowdown, if you will, of, 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 a, of, the, um, of the rollout. Um, one, I, I think that has moved along, though. I, I don't know that that is. I think, I think folks have become very used to this um, more uh, than, than they were in the past. And so, so now that's maybe much less of an issue. Uh, but we still have just in general health literacy and um, how do we maintain uh, confidentiality, privacy, making sure that those lines are secure um, and all of the cybersecurity issues, another, another impediment. So I, I've listed a lot of the impediments that rural providers had to work through in order mm -hmm. to make this really successful uh, in their operation. Awesome. It's funny. It's, it seemed like every time... Uh, every couple of months, there'd be a new solution like, oh, we need access to care. And then, oh, we're going to use telephonic uh, solutions that don't need video conferencing. Right. Oh, once we do that, then, by the way, we need the next piece and the next piece. It seems like the last 12 to 18 months have just been this fast, rapid evolution of how we can streamline access and get it out quickly to the populations. And then to your other point, really facilitating it within the hospital system and the health system from an operational perspective and a financial perspective as well. Right. Um, Kaiser, I don't know if you want to chime in on that. There's a lot there to, to kind of chew on. You're on mute, by the way, so yeah. you may want to. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I I think you know what was you know, as Brock has meant, Brock mentioned it. What what was affecting you know what they kind of learned in the in the rural setting was the exact same thing we're we're learning everywhere. It didn't matter if you're in Silicon Valley or or rural. Like you start seeing the gaps in the in the workflow. You start looking at okay, well if if I have to shift, because we had to shift at times from, you know, if we were using Zoom or if we we're using Doximity or if we we're using some other platform from a video call, you know, it's one whether that, you know, whether it's a Medicare population or any population, part of the issue was even telecommunications. Did they have the internet capabilities? And if that didn't happen in the in the middle of a uh, of an exam, then you have to shift to telephonic, and then it's like, okay, well, how do I then? On the provider side, you now are having to say, okay, how do I document all of these things? And I have things, you know, in, in different places. And then at the same time, there's the security and the HIPAA aspects all associated with this. So, you know, that's just one piece. And then from an operational workflow piece, it's patient scheduling, communications. Um, so, so it's almost like everyone collectively was doing the the whole startup of like, you know, we're we're building the plane and flying it at the same time. And it's like, oh, wait, we need a, another screw here, another wheel here. And so, and I think it's starting, certain areas are starting to get a little bit more uh, streamlined, um, especially like at the, at the point of care in terms of just like what that communication, the fact that you have multiple ways of doing a, a, a video uh, visit, for example. And, and um, but then on the back end, it's like, okay, well, you know, as Brock had mentioned, we're in the public health pandemic, like, you know, uh, from a, from a, a government like uh, standpoint and, and in terms of funding, how does things change uh, when, when that changes, right? 
Um, so as we're building this, we've, we've had fuel along the way that's pumped the whole system forward, but, and now there's certain expectations and certain experiences that the, you know, that, that, that the patients are having and even the practitioners are having. So how do we maintain that if, if the models change? From a, from I, a yeah, I was uh, I was thinking back to like a prior life when uh, I did a lot around mobile and kind of omni-channel and consumer engagement in the retail or the bank and the financial services side. And, you know, Kaiser, we've talked a little bit about that whole omni-channel approach that kind of seems to be forced into healthcare right now, right? Um, as you think about what do you think the biggest challenge is for us to truly adopt this type of uh, omni-channel approach of, of providing care in healthcare today, now that we've kind of gotten to this tipping point, if you will. I, I think, uh, you know, the way we address that is looking at part of it's understanding the consumer. So in this case, we call our consumers patients uh, on one side. And then, you know, on the, on the other side of the, of the, of the market, it's, it's the uh, insurances, it's the health system. So, it's kind of understanding what this new world looks like. So, um, you know, when you looked at it 10 years ago in retail and in omni-channel, there wasn't that many people buying online. Like it was like less than like, it was like, if you can go from one to 2% overall, that's a big shift in terms of Amazon buying. But now the pandemic, you know, I would say that's probably like 10 X or 20 X easy. So there's probably like at least 20% of people, which, you know, is a significant boon, but that's the exact same thing that's happening here is convenience. You know, consumers want convenience from an Amazon standpoint, but now they're seeing in the pandemic that they had convenience in terms of they can talk to their, their physicians and so forth. And so it's like, we're going to have to shift kind of how we think and, and borrow. And, and maybe, you know, the, you're already starting to see some of those partnerships kind of happen. And you're already starting to see technology companies going into this space because they understand logistics and they understand services. But uh, they might understand privacy from a cybersecurity in, in, in terms of retail, but they might not understand it in, in HIPAA uh, capacities and also in terms of reimbursement. So I think there's going to be some interesting opportunities that we'll be seeing right now that are going to kind of unfold in the next couple of years. I don't know what, what Brock thinks about this, but I can go on. But <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I mean, I know that I love this dialogue because, you know, Kaiser's on like the bleeding edge of some of this stuff often. Times and Brock is like in the day to day with a lot of our, our hospitals are supporting this. So Brock, I mean, what have you seen from the rural perspective, especially with, you know, thinking of accessibility and technology and maybe access to care, and you have a lot of uh, these, you know, locations that may not have the specialties that they need. Do you believe that technology and access are really kind of the solution to this? What happens from the physician side? Like, how do we get enough in a doctor shortage? What are some of these rural communities offering in terms of local physicians versus maybe um, a physician group or uh, some of the technologies that offer their own physicians in their products? How do you yeah. have a response? Good, 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 great conversation. I, I, in my mind, is swimming in about a thousand different directions now because obviously I think one of the things that's going to drive this whole effort going forward is reimbursement, uh, frankly. Um, we've not determined and Medicare is still establishing policy. One of the reasons why Congress is hesitating on um, legislation to make a lot of these public health emergency issue, uh, public health emergency uh, uh, regulations now permanent is because of this huge concern of a rapid increase in the volume of these services. These are all paid, paid on unit based uh, arrangements. <laughs> And we've already seen just a huge escalation of these services uh, being provided um, in a fee-for-service context. Mm. And I think that one of the real, you talked about bleeding edge or leading edge conversations going on now is how can telehealth be wrapped into a, a value-based payment system that can rationalize the distribution of these services without encouraging uh, this unit or fee-for-service based uh, tremendous increase. So we're in this kind of weird time now because looking ahead to all the things Kaiser so capably described, we're not really sure what the payment mechanisms are going to be. And then number two, um, what's the alignment across payers? Medicare is, of course, the 100-pound the, uh, gorilla or however many pounds they weigh, uh, uh, I get there 800 pounds is the, is the line. Uh, but, but 
what about commercial insurances? Where are states at in terms of parity on payment for telehealth services versus uh, those that are in, in person? Um, and so we're, we're really navigating a lot of this terrain, as, as, as was said, uh, with a lot of unknowns. The variables are really not being well-defined at this point. And so going forward, uh, one of the things that we're interested in in rural communities is, is preserving access to care. And we, we would find it problematic to have players outside of rural parts of the United States coming in and taking over a lot of patient care that's being provided in person now. So then how do we incorporate or integrate telehealth, telemedicine with local providers to integrate this and making sure that, that there's a consistent um, a flow, if you will, of, of patients. Um, and then to the point of the shortage, workforce shortage, this is just really, uh, this is just top of mind. I, I don't think there's one day that goes by that I don't deal in some way with some severe workforce issue uh, somewhere in rural America. And I think there are some ways that telemedicine and telehealth can, can help with that. Um, I'm learning now just how in the surge that we're in now with the Omicron variant of the coronavirus, um, how the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, or ASPR as we call it, um, are now beginning to deploy through the National Guard and, and um, other resources telemedicine into places where surge is occurring to assist providers in caring for patients. So this is another real vista of opportunity that we have um, in this current surge that we're seeing now as well. Love it. Kaiser, do you wanna comment on that or? No, I think that, um, you know, Brock basically summarized, you know, uh, he said it well, and it, and, and it is going to be re basically revenue driven. And I think from an access and workforce standpoint, that's where there's a lot of opportunity. I, I guess the only things I would add is that, you know, whatever the solutions are for folks moving forward, because there's a lot of unknowns is, you know, creating an infrastructure with flexibility where you can navigate this. Because if you put too many, if you get, go very capital intensive on, on, on certain areas, since no one really has a good gauge of what the overall strategy is going to be, um, you might be, you know, spending money um, on things that are unnecessary, you know, unnecessarily. Yeah, yeah I was, uh, one of the comments I was going to make as Brock was kind of outlining, we have obviously the payment initiatives uh, that are in play right now, the alignment. Um, one of the big questions is what's the verdict on quality um, and outcomes with all of this telehealth uh, practices taking place? And what we're seeing, a lot of conversations and dialogues that I'm having with CHG's customers is that they're in the very early stages of trying to develop a real comprehensive strategy around telehealth. So for the last 12 to 18 months, there was a lot of reactionary um, kind of activity, right? So most, most have now gone from like maybe having one or two telehealth vendors to like seven or eight point solutions. And now they're trying to scale back into like a more digestible technology stance. Um, but it does feel like we're right on the edge, but no one really, there's a few companies who are really trying to get out on the edge and take that leap of developing a strategy with so many unknowns. We get a lot of questions at CHG where, uh, you know, clients are looking for guidance and going, hey, how do you think this is going to play out? Like we need, we know that we need to staff some of this uh, pretty comprehensively, but we're not quite sure how much to invest because of the payment uh, situation, and some of the regulatory concerns that we have plus the verdict is out on quality. So what we've seen or what I've experienced in a lot of my conversations is a little bit of a, um, a standstill, right? Like the, it feels like things have uh, settled down in terms of reactivity. And now everyone's kind of figuring out how they're gonna go forward in maybe a more measured fashion. Does that feel like what's happening? Maybe Brock on the rural health side, do you feel like people are starting to say, okay, we wanna, we wanna engage with this because we know it's here to stay, but we don't know what to what degree we're trying to figure out a strategy and a cohesive kind of um, structure to go to do to execute on this going forward. That's just terrific. I, I, my advice to people who I'm talking to that are implementing these systems is the, is three things. One, it, you have to demonstrate feasibility. I mean, obviously, if it's completely outside of the realm of possibility, it may sound good on paper, but if it's not feasible, it's not doable. Secondly, ask the question, is it comparable to the standards of care? 
I mean, we've, we've got to make sure that this is incredibly useful to, um, to in comparison to what's being done in the clinic. So there can't right. be wide variation there. And then secondly, and this is where I think the payers are going to be most concerned, is does it add or improve to outcomes? And that's where I think the gold is in terms of in terms of this, uh, the, the sequence of, of, of concern. What we need a lot more of and what is coming forth, and we're seeing a lot more of it being produced is research that documents those three elements, particularly that last piece. Mm -hmm. And once we get that last piece, payers will start to come to the table with options for payment of these services, I think in a more direct way, including Medicare, frankly. Um, but then I go back to my earlier comment, all within a value-based purchasing sort of uh, perspective, because we can't afford these huge increases in units of service um, that could potentially come as a result of, of these, uh, these met methods being used in that context. Right. And so I was thinking, uh, as you're walking through that, Brock, as we move kind of away from this transitional um, I guess, mode of telehealth that's been very transactional on a fee-for-service in towards kind of a continuity of care where telehealth becomes part of the second visit or maybe the follow-up or the post-op visit or maybe the second opinion or referral. We're starting to see way more of those use cases evolve um, rather than the kind of uh, one-off fee-for-service that maybe we had seen prior. And I think that's uh, hospitals as well as payers kind of hedging their bets <clears throat> into a more comprehensive model around telehealth and virtual care. Um, Kaiser, I know I'll shift this one over your way because you guys have done some things around patient continuity of care and also some of that second opinion model. And you guys have a product called Grand Rounds. And, you know, I, I think you guys are doing some pretty interesting stuff around this, this as well. Do you want to yeah. talk more about that? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll kind of, you know, just to segue kind of a little bit into this and, and also just some thoughts on, on, Bro on what Brock said it, is it has to be feasible. I think it also has to be something that involves, um, understanding the, the patient experience in terms of just in their overall everyday life and then the value-based outcomes part, which, you know, like, like you said, when you have increased units of services, it's like, you know, we're not going to reimburse this after a while. It's like, what was actually moved? So there's going to probably be some type of transition there, which kind of feeds into what you just, um, um, segueing into, into this, we kind of realized, uh, in, in some ways that if we look at patients, just like, uh, uh, in terms of how they, you know, the, the customer experience in general, it's about time and convenience. And so what we realize is that, you know, if I, any of us here on this webinar, if we go in for a doctor's appointment, we know that, okay, even if I get there on time, I might have to wait for about 15 to 30 minutes, depending on the, on the provider, and it might even be longer. And if there's emergencies, um, and even if you have an emergency and you go into an urgent care or an ER, unless there's, you know, significant trauma that they can see, you're waiting. And then, you know, and then when you go in and you see the doctor, you might have all this ancillary testing, you might have ancillary staff, and you might have maybe five to 10 minutes with the actual practitioner. And people who you think are the practitioners are just, you know, could be the physician assistant or the nurse that's giving great quality of care, but, you know, the, the, the patient at the end of the day comes across unsatisfied and might at any point in time in that on a value-based like outcome, because you're getting also scores from the, from the patient side as well, they might have some issues with those experiences. And we feel that from, you know, from our healthcare, it might be, we gave great care, the physicians and everything were there, but they, they had some issue with the admin. So the point is, is customer experience and time. So what we realize is maybe we can offer different types of solutions. So for example, for certain types of patients that we see that we get referred into, um, you know, so, so one, one disease that we, that we get is a disease called glaucoma. Um, and so, and, that, and that's actually trending uh, as, you know, globally as, as one of, the, um, as one of the, the eye diseases to follow just given the aging population. And it's, you know, it's, it's an irreversible blinding disease. So you think about the costs associated downstream. Um, well, in terms of getting these kind of referrals of, is this patient glaucoma or not? What we started doing is we, we took advantage of telehealth. So we started having initial like evaluations that were virtual. So we did this asynchronous model. So, and the, the approach was, hey, we wanna value your time, we'll see you. And then you can go and get all the diagnostic tests done separately. 
And so they can set, set up an appointment where they just go in and get the diagnostic testing. I have that all in my EMR. So then I have another virtual visit. So they see me twice virtually, and then they, they get the diagnostic testing in between. And then if there's anything further where they have to see someone in person, they can schedule it. But it was based on this, this value of the consumer's time. And they, and they were familiar with it. And what was interesting was there wasn't, you know, whether it was the Medicare population or whether it was the, you know, some of the young, uh, you know, engineers or, and, you know, the hip kids, everyone all like could understand. And that kind of goes to the education that the pandemic kind of served in the sense of that we had to all go through this together. So, you know, that allowed us to take advantage of that. If that didn't exist, this would not have been possible. In terms of grand rounds, this goes into the fact that, okay, well, how do we create different revenue streams that aren't necessarily dependent from a value-based outcome uh, and, and reimbursement? And that's more, uh, and this is where we're still kind of learning. So grand rounds, as, as you mentioned, that came from some, some physicians here at Stanford that uh, looked at creating kind of a second uh, opinion like workflow um, digitally. And so basically you can ask, um, you pay a certain amount of money. I think it's roughly like uh, 700 dollars, and this is not. This is all from the patient side, and they can, who whatever university or health system that's affiliated with that, there'll be groups of doctors that will respond, and then you know, then there's a rev share between the the health system, the physician, and the um, and obviously grand rounds. And what's nice about that kind of model is that can be, you can create a lot of different products within that, you know, it could be, okay, we can return this within 24 hours, within a week and so forth. And so I think one of the opportunities is leveraging the technology and the accessibility in different ways and kind of looking at what are the price sensitivities. I mean, for example, all of us, whether we're Apple or Google or something like that, dependent or Amazon, we all have multiple subscriptions. And we don't know how much collectively, we, we might have multiple subscriptions with the same provider. Apple has a lot of my money, but you know, why can't we do something similar in, in the same space? And so I think what you're gonna start seeing is some interesting ways of ingenuity, because as we know, when CM, CMS changes things, you know, the people ahead of the curve thinking about how can I, now that I have this patient population or I have this captive group, how can I keep them from a, you know, a retention? It's very similar to how you think, and you know this, Matt, being in, you know, you know, in the mobile space and stuff. How do I keep those patients? How do I do that kind of CRM? So I think we're going to see a lot of borrowing from other types of uh, industries in, in this space. And that's kind of what we've started doing is we kind of are looking at patients differently. We're looking at them as they value convenience and they value time. How do we actually be, uh, service those and how much are they willing to pay for it? Awesome. No, I love that. Thanks. Thanks, Kaiser. That was awesome. And Brock, actually, it, it kind of sparked something in me to ask you. And I know this is a little bit out, out of left field, but have you seen any interesting revenue models with some of your rural health hospitals where they've said, um, hey, we might want to collectively pool these physicians and leverage them in a separate way, or we might use technology to maybe fill some of these areas in rural, uh, in rural areas where we maybe didn't have this type of specialty services and that will help us increase our billings or that will help us kind of create more stickiness with our consumers or, you know, is telehealth becoming a part of their strategy to really drive revenue or is it about like still about playing defense a little bit in some of these rural hospitals? Have you seen anything interesting? Yeah, I, I, I have. I will say at the outset that I think a lot of attention in most rural hospitals has been paid to surges of uh, pandemic related uh, volume. But when there is an opportunity to, for the head to come up above the water and, uh, and talk about these sorts of things, um, I think two things. One, the Comprehensive Primary Care Plus program, which is a demonstration of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation that has really attempted to try and remove all the regulatory issues that physicians have in their clinics in terms of providing care. Uh, and so they've allowed for the use of uh, text and uh, telephone calls and other services to enhance the care to the patients that are in their panel uh, without having to document those in, in formal ways that then rise to the level of an E&M code to bill for that visit. So care can be distributed in a, in, a, in, a, in a different way. Now that's one demonstration. The other demonstration is in the Pennsylvania Rural Health Model where they're employing the global budget program in hospitals 
where the hospital, based on a previous uh, average of net patient revenue, gets a fixed block of money uh, for that next year in which to operate. And so they have more flexibility now in terms of how some of their funding is spent and where some of the value is received from the funding that's uh, being generated. So what I'll use there as an example is hospitals that are engaging in uh, stroke care, telestroke, and they're finding now the uh, access to what Kaiser was talking about a second ago, this kind of subscription model uh, can be very effective in providing care to patients, particularly uh, in, a, in, in their acute phase of say, uh, stroke diagnosis and treatment. So, so those are some of the things that I've seen and I may not have answered the question directly, but, but that's some of the work that I've seen done. Yeah, no, that was great, this is awesome. Um, we're starting, we're, we're seeing actually more and more requests um, from our side as well for some of the telehealth uh, models and, and, you know, whether it's hardware and software that are connecting in the hospital, but I think we're starting to see a higher adoption of a lot of those, um, at least requests from the staffing perspective. They're asking for neurologists or cardiologists or oncologists to come in and kind of serve as that proxy, if you will, the remote proxy, and then having that as kind of a shared service across multiple health systems. So whether it's a subscription model um, or a base of a subscription and a, and a per transaction model. Um, <clears throat> we're seeing a lot of needs for that across our rural health hospitals too. So I think that's a great, there's some models there that work and some that are kind of difficult with the sh shared services. And it's all about, I think someone, and Kaiser may be brought up how much demand, you know, that demand flow is kind of key is making sure that consumers and the hospitals um, have the volume and the patients and the consumer experience to really get that to the physicians. Um, I want to shift gears. I know we've, we've just got a couple seconds left, or we got about uh, 20 minutes left, but I, I did want to get, um, you know, we've been talking a lot about health systems perspectives on this. Um, you know, uh, Brock or Kaiser, maybe I'll just leave it to either of the two of you guys. Um, have you had real specific physician conversations about how do doctors want to move forward with their career with telehealth incorporate, like all of us now, we're all remote. Well, I'm in the office today, but uh, I think and because you're probably in the office, but we, we switch between a hybrid model. Most of us are in the office a couple of days, then we're home a few days. Um, we've had a lot of our colleagues who have gone and moved states and kind of cross borders and all of those things. Do you see physicians as really wanting to embrace telehealth as maybe their primary way that they're engaging with patients and they're supporting their health systems? Um, or do you see physicians kind of wanting to be, I like coming in the office. I have three little girls, so this keeps me sane, right? Um, but do you see them kind of picking and choosing or do you see a lot of them like wanting to do this full time or do you see this kind of an ancillary piece of what they're already doing with their, with their employers? Uh, Brock, do you want me to, do you want to? Yes, please. I mean, I'm curious. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. I think, you know, having, having, spent my career in, 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 with different hats, I've done locums, I've done, you know, I've done private practice and I've done, uh, and I'm in academics is, you know, you get visibility, you know, from peers in, in three different ways. So I have friends that have done locums. I've had friends that have done private practice. And then as a, as someone in an academic institution, we train so many, you know, med students, residents, and fellows. So you start seeing shifts in how they think. And I think I started seeing that with, you know, um, I guess I'm a cusper, so I'm not quite millennial and not quite like Gen, I'm more Gen X than I am millennial, but um, we start seeing just shifts in how they view life and they, they view balance. And you're starting to see more folks that way. And what we, what we didn't realize before was like, when you become a physician, you know, it's, it's a, it takes away a good like decade at least in terms of training. And so all your, all your colleagues are training in, in, in different things in terms of, you know, they might be engineers, they might be lawyers that, you know, they, they pick different career paths and they start seeing, you know, where physicians go more with the delayed gratification than get into the workforce. You know, these folks, you know, their, their peers aren't. And that's not, that trend is starting to, you know, I think what the pandemic did was it allowed physicians to say, oh, well, I can actually work from home. Like, I didn't even know this was an opportunity because, you know, the infrastructure wasn't there. You know, 10 years ago, I could have done telemedicine. I could have been like the telemedicine doctor. I was like when I was at UC Davis, I covered like four states from a telemedicine standpoint. 
the billing alone of the demand from like, you know, Dybeck, Renopoli screenings, like because of the reimbursement, because it was reimbursed driven, I could not afford to live just off that. Uh, but now I think you're, you're in a world where you can do that. You can have the flexibility. And to your point, you gave the three different scenarios. Maybe I want some, maybe I want, you know, all, or maybe I want, you know, you know, uh, some kind of a hybrid. We now have the infrastructure to support that. And so I think you're going to see a lot more folks that are wanting to do that. I think there's still certain barriers that, you know, you know, can be addressed. One of them is just licensing and making sure you have the credentialing to do that. I mean, we all know, you know, from, uh, I'm sure Brock knows this as well, is if you're just trying to take a group and have them across there, they have to be credentialed. And if they're doing any procedures, you know, if they're doing them in, in surgery centers, then you have to make sure that everything's on the up and up across all of those or else you're billing and then you're having to, you, you can't bill actually. So, um, so, as that gets streamlined, it's going to make it a lot easier for folks to be able to be in different parts of the world. And we're starting to see some of that. I think I, I, I mentioned, uh, you know, just, just right before we started, some of these models are already occurring in different, different countries. So the UK is incorporating some of these models and it's working pretty well, but they're all like kind of pilots and with different types of, you know, health systems, both academic and also uh, private. But, but um, when I kind of like just kind of do the... Um, you know, my own surveys of like, kind of like the, you know, younger colleagues, they're very much more amenable. They want to have that kind of lifestyle similar to, to their folks that are like the, you know, the nomadic, you know, programmer or artist that is able to go around the world and also at the same time provide some kind of service. I think now the physician will be able to do that. So it's, it's going to be pretty exciting. And I think we have to be very much um, able to su support that because I think that's where the world's moving for, from the provider standpoint. So that's a good question, Matt, because a lot of awesome. people, yeah, they don't look at the provider as, as a key cog in, 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 in this, in this sense. Uh, absolutely. I mean, when we talk about our consumers, our consumers are physicians, right? For the most part. And um, same with your hospital, same with the hospital systems that we support. Um, uh, Brock, one more question, I guess, to, to piggyback on that. Do you feel like as physicians maybe want to enter into this kind of hybrid work model, do you feel like, what do you think the biggest challenges or do you feel like hospitals, uh, especially in the rural health areas, are ready and willing to embrace and maybe invest in this model? Or do you think we're still a little, little bit further out on really wanting to invest in some of the resources and technology and things that it will take to really deploy it the way that maybe physicians want to? Or do you think there'll be a little bit of a gap there for some time? Well, I, I think that, again, some of the structures need to be put into place to make this really work extremely easily make it more e make it easier so for example um, getting the um, interstate medical licensure compact and and you know being able to navigate some of the efficiencies that are being developed in some uh, parts of the country many states are participating in that now uh, you know, understanding what that means. Then in credentialing and privileging in their own facilities, um, how do you make sure your primary source verification is maintained? Mm -hmm. um, yep. Who who holds those documents? Is it the is it the distant site provider or is it the local provider? I mean, there's so many questions that 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 providers are asking now in terms of how to implement this and to be appropriate, especially with regard to. Uh, accreditation organizations and others coming in and, and looking at all of that. Um, keep in mind, I mean, it's amazing the emergence of, of compacts now. Uh, we're seeing this with uh, nurse licensure, physical therapy, audiology, speech, language, uh, psychology is now an important uh, area. In fact, um, uh, I'm sure the, your listeners know this, but uh, behavioral health and mental health services are the largest, the single largest use of of, uh, of telehealth services in the in the nation right now. And it's and you're seeing what Kaiser was talking about with ads on evening TV to to uh, click here and you can be taken to a a mental health professional uh, to help you. Um, and this is just taking it directly to the consumer and they're accessing it directly through, uh, 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 through an ad that may be generated on, online or on television. So rural providers, I think, are, and this is part of the issues that we have that, that are always been uh, problematic. The first is broadband access. So 
So yeah. what are the what are the circuits in rural America that are able to carry all of these uh, fancy things that we're talking about? Uh, the second issue is bandwidth. Uh, bandwidth now, in terms of of just the human the, the 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 brain brain capital needed to make all this work. So you've got structures in rural hospitals that are. Um, I call them, they're an inch deep and a mile wide in terms of leadership. Uh, you've got departments with one or two people in each one, and then you've got the CEO administrator. And uh, then you may have some other folks uh, in that, but uh, this sometimes takes attention, it takes strategy, it takes development, and you can't do that when you've got everybody working on five different things in their job that they're doing every day. And so some of those realities are what seeps into this, but I think that as we start to look at the structures becoming more clear in what I talked about earlier, then I can see the strategy starting to take place in these facilities to become more apparent. Awesome, that's perfect. And actually, uh, Brock, thank you. That was a perfect segue to our next question, which you didn't <laughs> intend to do. So um, I'm gonna have our team pop up the, uh, the next survey, we've got a couple questions in a row here, guys. So if you're in the audience, just hang with us. I think we got three quick ones that will come, uh, that will pop on the screen. Uh, the first one is, assuming you use more telehealth during the pandemic, have you created a telehealth strategy for the future? So, you know, multiple choice, you can pick one of these, yes, no, or we really currently don't use it. Uh, second one, how will you, how will you use telehealth in the future? If you do have or are formulating a strategy, is it really around those pre post-op visits? Is it uh, really highly incorporating into some of your care management models like we've talked about? We've kind of touched on a lot of these, um, extending gaps into underserved areas. Or is it a part of your growth strategy? Do you have a revenue model that's really tied to how you're going to attract new consumers and patients and really kind of extend into new uh, upside and opportunity? Or if it's not part of your strategy, that's okay too. Um, I'll give you a second here and we'll share some results when that's complete. Um, this is the awkward silence. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. The first moment of awkward silence. That's not bad. We're 50 minutes into this. So, okay. Let's see, team. I was uh, not sure if that's taking a second to pop up while everyone forgot the music. Was... Yeah, I know. I could. You guys don't want to see me dance, but. <laughs> I think uh, <clears throat> I've loved this conversation, though. I think that it's been it's been fun to kind of span between, geez, what's happening on the bleeding edge, what's happening in some of the the mainstay parts of America, and I mean, it'll be so fascinating to see how this plays out. Um, you know, I think that everyone's kind of invested in this at this point. There's very few people that are totally on the sidelines, but I do think we have some folks who are kind of dipping their toe in. So, um, Let's see, I'm not seeing the results on the question, so maybe we can have them go to the, here we go. Looks like it showed up. If everybody can see this, um, assuming you use more telehealth during the pandemic, have you created a strategy? Yes, 73% of our respondents have a strategy in place. Um, how will we use in the future? Anything that surprises you guys, Kaiser or Brock, highly incorporating the care management models, using some gaps in underserved areas kind of surprises me a little bit. Um, and then also growth around high margin specialty, some of those specialty services we talked about. Is there anything, Brock, that kind of jumps out at you here? No, I think that care management models um, that would naturally fit, I think, into this telehealth environment. Um, one of the things I felt like I wanted to mention today, just as setting the stage for the future, is hospital at home movement and how mm -hmm. remote patient monitoring will become Integra integrated into this whole discussion that we're having now around telehealth and telemedicine. Uh, to keep in mind that those, uh, those remote patient monitoring uh, data and services can be seen in several different locations. Um, and so with the patient at home and the originating site, um, care can be decentralized. And uh, we're seeing some remarkable success with that around the country. And actually going back to my earlier model of feasibility, standards of care and outcomes, um, outcomes in those environments are, are much higher because patients are able to be taken care of in their home and they're not encumbered by the routines of a hospital. It pains me to say that as a hospital administrator, but, uh, but that's uh, the reality of it. Um, so I think remote patient monitoring is a vista that I, I'm looking forward to see how we can incorporate that more into uh, this discussion. 
I love that, Brock. Thank you. I know we've kind of shied away from talking about like some of the big names that have come into this space over the last six to 12 months, right? But you're seeing, you know, Amazon definitely is making a play for this market eventually and some of the home health care, um, CVS, Aetna, Optum, you know, you're seeing some pretty big uh, players that are really starting to focus on how we can take the local physician or take, you know, a lot of uh, our localized uh, practitioners and really use technology to deploy them in an almost on-demand model that maybe we could do better than we were doing in some of the rural health settings. Um, Kaiser, what are your, and we've got just a couple more minutes here, yeah. your thoughts on that? And I think that's a, it's so, there's so much greenfield there that yeah. everyone's looking at. Um, I have a little bit of this like bias that was when we were around for the consumer directed model and everything was going to go consumer directed during the nineties. And then it was, um, you know, a, we're trying to really push consumer driven uh, models around you know, choice and access to care and everything. So it feels a little repetitive, but I feel like the technology has maybe gotten there to where there's some interesting models that could really develop out of this. Yeah, Kaiser, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, so, so two thoughts. One thing, so I'll talk about just in terms of that, I agree with you in terms of the, uh, you know, the, the, the consumer focus and at home model. I, you know, one group that you should also mention there is just like the tele telecom. And so like Comcast, you know, mm -hmm. that's one because they already have an infrastructure. They already come and put your cable in. So imagine a similar model where so so it's kind of thinking about these folks that you know we you know I've had conversations with some of these folks just in regards to they already have the infrastructure built in. They already have a hundred thousand employees that they can deploy deploy in terms of like driving to these different locations. So you know we look at Amazon, but you can also look at the folks that you know also are going to supply the broadband and the other things in these rural areas. They could do you know. So I think you're going to see pretty interesting things there. So why not, why it be Uber Eats, why not be Comcast for health in, you know, in rural Arkansas, for example. Um, and then the other thought was, I was surprised about the, just from a feasibility, like what is actually practical for right now, that pre and post stop, I thought was kind of interesting that there was such a small amount that thought that that is from a strategy standpoint, because I could put somebody that is a physician assistant or nurse, uh, you know, uh, in that role. And I could have a video of actually the surgeon there and they can just go through it. That is considered a, a, a telehealth post-op or pre-op kind of visit. And uh, that's something that can be done right now with very minimal friction in terms of the workflow. So I thought that number would be higher. Yeah, nice, I love it. Okay, um, that's a great note to, to wrap. We've got a couple Q and A questions. I know people had, had typed a few in here. So um, I'm gonna go and just pull one out. And I think that, um, a lot of folks are having questions. We do get a lot of calls of, hey, if we have our physician here or we're using our full-time doctor there and then we use a third party for this billing or we use a 1099 for this. So I'm going to ask the question directly as it came to us. Our organization is struggling with employment taxation laws for individuals that live outside of our tri-state coverage area. In other words, those outside of that area, aren't call we aren't calling them employees. We're providing 1099 or in our case, locum tenants, right? Um, for this in the tri-state, can we employ and offer benefits or how are others handling kind of this issue around state employment laws with telehealth and kind of covering, because the state license is one piece and then it's the employee as a service or a 1099 contractor and payroll and everything else. Do you guys have any suggestions here or should we maybe follow up with this one offline? It's, it's creating quite the headache. I will tell you that like yeah. a lot of, uh, you know, as we start to get into multi-state uh, locations and multi-state work sites, um, you know, if you have any comments around this one, I think that like maybe consult with your tax professional is probably like a good one, right? Um, yeah, the model exists because we've had to do it from an academic standpoint. So like we'll have patients where, we're, you know, that we'll have to like kind of like evaluate from that standpoint. From the physician and the provider standpoint, we're not able to deploy that multi-state um, but we know folks that can, and you know, obviously one's here that's leading this discussion in terms of comp health. So yeah, I, 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 I agree with your sentiments, but I know that there's a model that exists here. Um, so maybe that's a that, that's more of a conversation with, with Matt and, and, <laughs> and that individual. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, guys, we got, yeah, Brock, any comment on that one? If not, no, we, no, no, I, I we don't want to wade into ago. that territory. I when agree. it comes to physicians and their money to uh, yeah. just <laughs> they stay silent. <laughs> I agree. Um, well, listen, gentlemen, I, uh, I, I really appreciate you taking the time for us today. 
Um, I know that we've had a lot of attendees. Hopefully everybody's had a good um, had a good time here in the last hour. I've really appreciated speaking with both of you gentlemen. Um, Brock, it's so good to see you. Kaiser, thank you. so fantastic to see you. If you guys have any, Brock, anything, any last words you'd like to throw out there? And then Kaiser, I'll give you the stage too. Brock, are you? No, no, just uh, good luck everyone in your efforts. And uh, we, we in our policy shop at National World Health Association are on top of a lot of the issues that I was talking about today. And yeah, um, and that's something that we'll, we'll continue to work on. Awesome. Kaiser, any last words? No, I just echo what Brock says. Just good luck and just know that, you know, everyone, this is a new frontier for everyone. So even though you think that there's all these players and there's not opportunities, there's actually quite a few. And we kind of talked about a, a lot of them. So it's wide open, like you said, Matt. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, gentlemen, thank you again for your time. Everyone, thanks for joining. Fun thank conversation. You. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Bye.